Welcome to this presentation about uh, our book, The Dali Legacy. And first of all, I would like to thank the curators and staff of the Salvador Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, and particularly the research staff at the archives where I was allowed to do part of the research for this book. So what is the Dali legacy about? Well, my co-author, Christopher Brown, and I wanted to find out two things. First of all, what is the secret of Dali's enduring popularity in the 21st century? Now, that's not a given. There are many other artists of the 20th century that today are all but forgotten except for a small group of art historians and critics. And the second thing we wanted to discover is what was the primary influence on his exceptional realism? That is what we admire so much in Dali paintings today, especially when you go to the Dali Museum in St. Petersburg. These, these beautiful canvases with that gorgeous realism, where, where did the impulses for that technique come from? Now, some of you uh, may know my books that I've written for National Geographic. In addition to being an art historian, I'm also an archeologist. And I've been always very interested in the archeology span of the Middle East. But uh, the book that we're talking about today is part of a series of books that uh, my dear friend Christopher Brown and I have written about specifically artists like Leonardo da Vinci. And our unique focus in these books is to try to place the artist in the context of his time. You know, so often do I get a sense when I read the books of my peers that the author is so focused on the creative development of his subject that the author forgets the fact that any painter or any artist is really informed by the social and cultural context of his time. Everyone, we, including ourselves, we are a product of the environment in which we live. So again, let me give you an example. And in, in the book, Young Leonardo, which was published by St. Martin's Press, uh, we sort of debunked this idea that Leonardo was a celebrated court artist at the court of Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan. And our research indicated that that was really not true, that the vast majority of the Duke's budget went to massive cultural projects, such as the construction of the great cathedral in Milan, to which Leonardo never gained access. It was for these major projects that the Duke always relied on Lombard artists, artists from Lombardy, who did the work on time and on budget and, and basically produced what the Duke wanted to see. It was not terribly imaginative, but it was certainly reliable. And Leonardo was really just on the fringes, producing portraits of the Duke's mistresses. But when it came to creating an official state portrait, uh, he, he clearly turned to the artist in his, own, in his own orbit. And the same goes in a way for our other book, The Da Vinci Legacy, where we tackle the question, how is it that Leonardo is such a pop icon today? You know, when Leonardo died uh, in 1519 in exile in the French city of Amboise, he was all but forgotten in his native Italy. Um, Italy at that time, in the center of Italian artistic endeavor, Rome, was all gaga about big pop stars like Raphael and Michelangelo. They were the new celebrities on the artistic firmament. And Leonardo was all but forgotten. So how did, how did he then become so famous? And we discovered that really the key to understanding that process is the development of the first mass medium in history, namely the copper engraving. There were other forms of reproduction, of course, the woodblock engraving that Dürer made so famous, but these, this system, this technology didn't allow for the fine detail that was needed to reproduce something like the Last Supper fresco. And so what you see is that when copper engraving becomes uh, widespread in Europe, one of the first engravings that enjoyed distribution across Europe 
was Leonardo's Last Supper. And so it is the engravings of the Last Supper and later of the Mona Lisa that sustained his memory and ultimately made him the star that, that he is today. So these are sort of the things that we're very interested in in finding a, a, a unique angle, and looking at a, at a painter from a very fresh angle. So for this book, The Dali Legacy, we looked at things that some of the others have not, at least not yet today. For example, the impact of Spain's incredible depression after World War I, uh, the influence of avant-garde movements. Uh, of course, we know about surrealism, and Dali's a very prominent role in that movement, but there were many other avant-garde movements between the two world wars in which Dali was very, very interested. The Spanish Civil War, it's a difficult subject, but clearly it touched on Dali and his work very, very clearly. And the impact of World War II on his development as an artist. And of course, another sensitive subject is him living in Spain under the regime of Generalissimo Franco. And finally, the, the incredible inspiration that he drew from the science of the atomic age. So once again, we're looking for painting a three-dimensional portrait of the artist as informed and shaped by the unique forces of his time. Now, to begin with, uh, it's very important to stress that um, Salvador Dali was not just a Spanish artist, he was from Catalonia, from Catalan. And even today, uh, Catalonia has been very much in the news because of its desire to become independent uh, from uh, the Spanish monarchy. And that sentiment was very much alive in the early 20th, 20th century, as we will see. Now, Dali was born in the city called Figueres, um, which was part of uh, Catalonia. And uh, we make a point in the book to point out that the distance from Figueres to the French border is shorter than the distance to the nearest major Spanish city, in this case, Barcelona. What that means is that Catalonia was always a little bit more French than Spanish. It had a lot of affinity with French culture. It was part of French culture for a long time. So that will always play a major role in his art. Secondly, uh, the family of Salvador Dali, his father, uh, purchased a very modest family place on the peninsula called Cap de Creus, uh, which you see here in the red circle. And of course, uh, that is a region, and you see a photo here of some of the beautiful rocky coastline of Cap de Creus, would be a tremendous impact on Dali. The, the, the image of the Bay of Cap de Creus, and specifically places like uh, Port Yigat and, um, and uh, Caracas, um, places around that bay, uh, would, would be a dominant motif throughout the arc of his creative career. Eventually, he even bought a cabin in Port Yigat, and that's where uh, he would uh, work for, for many, many years. And even upon his death, uh, he would, he, there were still works there uh, in that cabin. So a beautiful place. In fact, when I was uh, a little kid, uh, I grew up in Holland and immigrated to the United States in the 1970s to do my doctorate in, in New York at Columbia University. Uh, my, as a kid, my, my father would drive us to this area, uh, and this is where we would have our summer vacations. It was a two-day drive from Holland. It was a long drive. But so this is very familiar territory for me, and I, I on the Costa Brava, as it's called, and and still a very popular vacation place uh, to this day. Now, it's interesting that um, while Chris and I were working on uh, the book on the, about Dali, I was also preparing a lecture series that uh, will be released later this year on Vincent van Gogh, or Vincent van Gogh, as he should be pronounced. And I was struck by the similarity between these two artists. For example, did you know that both Dali and van Gogh were born after an older sibling by the same name, so Salvador Dali and Vincent van Gogh, uh, died in infancy. And of course, 
in Dali's case, that made a huge impact on him. You know, he, he sort of carried the memory of his deceased sibling with him all of his life. Um, von Vincent, it made less of an impact, though, of course, he was very much aware uh, that, that uh, this happened and that um, it really put a, a great, had a great impact on, on his parents. Both would enroll in an art academy only to be evicted. <laughs> and, and as a result, both Dali and, and, and Vincent are largely self-taught in a way. I mean, of course, they had instructors and they attended the academy, but much of their development came on their own power, uh, so to speak. Both, of course, would go to Paris, which was the mecca of avant-garde art, starting with Impressionism in the 19th century, all the way through the interbellum between the two world wars. And that's where they both absorbed all of these avant-garde uh, developments. And interestingly enough, both would leave extensive writings about the development of their art and themselves as an artist. Uh, Dali in the form of books and tracts and articles, very prolific writer. And Vincent, of course, in the form of his letters. He wrote some 600 letters. But what you see is that Dali is really a very precocious and very talented young man, uh, artist from a very early age. Uh, th this painting, which is in our book, and I'm, I'm gonna show you these illustrations uh, taken from the book, Landscape, was begun when he was only six years old. Can you imagine? You know, look at this beautiful work of art and imagine it. He begun this work, he started work on it when he was only six years old. And this, of course, uh, the woman with the picture is clearly an impressionist work when you can see the sharp contrast between light and dark, between sunlight and shadow, uh, a dash of Monet and, and other impressionists. And uh, it's actually uh, a dear friend of his, Ramon Pichon, who was a member of a very affluent family. They were clients of Dali's father. Uh, and he's the one who introduced Dali to Impressionism and other movements that uh, took him under his wing. And the woman with the picture was painted in 1918 when he was only 16 years old. So you can see that Dali was a very, very talented artist right from, from the beginning. Now, 1918, as I said earlier, was a very pivotal year in Spain. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with, the, with the history, but Spain, of course, was a, was a major world power as early as the 16th century and well until the early 19th century with, with colonies throughout Latin America, the Philippines, you know, so still a very, very great power to reckon with. And uh, during World War I, Spain was one of the few countries that remained neutral in the conflict between the French and the British and later the Americans on the one hand and and um, Germany and Austria-Hungary on the other. Terrible war, the first industrial war. And so, of course, both belligerents needed neutral nations to supply them with textiles, ammunition, raw materials, foodstuffs, whatever you can think of. And Spain was one of the principal suppliers of, that, of all that of uh, export that these people needed to wage war. So what happened is that when peace came in 1918, that economy evaporated and, and Spain imploded, really economically imploded. And you hear stories of people lined up at soup kitchens and bread lines and of course mass unemployment. And that created the tensions between right and left that would ultimately produce the Spanish Civil War and, and shaped uh, the, uh, Dali's thinking. You know, it was a beginning in those years. It was very much uh, on the socialist side of the equation. Now, the other thing that Dali did early on was a keen interest in the old masters. Uh, when he was in school, he actually started a monthly magazine. It had about six issues, but, but each magazine carried a profile of a great master. You know, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo Dürer, Albrecht Dürer, the German Renaissance artist, El Greco, Velasquez, and of course, Goya. So you can see right from the beginning, he had a very intuitive understanding of the power of these old masters. 
and then both before and after his enrollment at the Art Academy in Madrid, he became aware of the avant-garde movements that were largely emerging in Paris and France, but were also percolating throughout Europe at that time, particularly things like uh, Fauvism, and you can see uh, his painting here of his father, uh, created with Fauvist colors. And, and, and what you see now in the next images that I'm going to show you, he sort of sampled each of those styles and, and sort of tried to work in that particular style to see if he liked it or not. And very much the same way that Vincent van Gogh did. And so you can see that the, the, the development of Dali as an artist was really informed by a very broad range of exposure to the modernist movements of his time. In addition to Fauvism, we have Pointillism. Uh, the idea, this was based on a, on a crazy theory that if you, if you painted uh, a work with tiny dots of complementary color, that your brain would decode these dots into an overall image that was very much the way the eye perceived the natural world. It didn't really work, of course, but for a time, everybody was very, very smitten with this particular theory, including Dali, and he tried it out in this wonderful painting of uh, people frolicking uh, in, uh, in the ocean. And then he tried Cubism. Of course, Cubism is a development of, of Georges Braque and Pablo Picasso, where uh, basically, they took their cue from Paul Cezanne and slowly collapsed the three-dimensional world into back into the two-dimensional surface of the canvas. This is where the 500-year history of Western art from the Renaissance to the 20th century comes to a standstill, where artists say, no, we're going to go back to the canvas as a two-dimensional surface, and we're going to try to create our own world the way art should see it, using the, the, the medium of, of a flat surface. And you can see here Dali's self-portrait on the left hand, and in the book, as you can see, we have placed it right next to Picasso's portrait of Amboise Bollard. And you can see the obvious similarity between the two. So once again, he was sort of sampling like a, from a large banquet, you know? <laughs> he was sort of sampling various styles to see if it suited him uh, or not. And, and one thing that I think is, is so important and not always emphasized in the books I've written about, uh, I've read, uh, read about Dali, is that at the same time, he was able to go to the Prado Museum and for the first time see these beautiful Baroque Spanish masters, Murillo, Velasquez, uh, up close and personal. Now, and this is something that is very difficult for us in the 21st century to understand, you know, we are surrounded by color reproductions, you know, on the web, in our books, television, on our laptop, everything is in color, everything is in color, digital color, right? Well, that was not the case in the 1920s. Uh, there were, of course, books about art, but most of these books were printed in black and white, the very early form of photographic printing. And color, color photography in printed books did not really emerge until just before and after World War II. So for someone who basically grew up with reproductions of art, either as engravings or as black and white photographs, to see these works in color, in the flesh, was an incredible experience and something that we simply will never be able to truly understand. And that was the impact of the Prado. And the impact of seeing these Baroque artists, of course, would stay with Dali for the rest of his life. And so you see that one of the first great masterpieces that Dali painted in 1925, uh, the figure at a window, which is really a, a, a portrait of Anna, his sister, staring at the window, is clearly informed by the old masters. And, We've uh, juxtaposed uh, this painting of Kaspar David Friedrich, uh, Woman at the Window. And you can see the great similarity between the two. I'm not saying specifically that he had this painting in mind, but certainly this is a style of art, of old master painting that made such a deep impression on Dali that, that his first great masterpiece, 
And you can see the, the stunning realism that absolutely owes nothing to the modernist movements that he had played with in the preceding years. In the same way, look at this work uh, from a year later, The Basket of Bread, which is so obviously uh, influenced by the great still lives of painters like Murillo, or in this case, Melendez, uh, The Afternoon Meal. And, and this is something that the Spanish Baroque artists gave Dali like none, no other. And that is the, the sense of texture, the sense that each form in nature has its own unique texture. And that's how it distinguishes itself. And Dali would always be very fascinated by that idea of both soft and hard objects and the difference of their textures, as we will see uh, in a moment. Of course, the, the real uh, um, revelation, if you will, for Dali was his contact with surrealism. Now, it's interesting to remember that surrealism was not like the other movements that we just talked about, such as Impressionism, Fauvism, and so forth. Those were styles. Surrealism wasn't really a style. It was a way of thinking. It was an attitude, if you will, a state of mind. And it was motivated by the idea that all of the chaos and destruction of World War I had come about as a over-reliance on rationalism, on reason. It was basically the end of the Enlightenment, right? That we had rationalized the world to such a degree, particularly also in art through the uh, classicism that we will see in a moment, that there was nothing left for artists to discover. And so instead, uh, surrealism thought the solution lay in the opposite in the world of spiritualism, the spontaneous. Uh, Breton referred to it as, uh, André Breton, one of the great theorists of surrealism, referred to it as l'automatisme, l'automatisme, the idea of spontaneous, welling up visions, dreams, ideas that pop into your head uh, and should be captured without any form of interference, right? That is really surrealism. And so you see that when different artists grapple with that, it uh, they come with, up with very different solutions. You know, Giorgio de Chirico, Max Ernst, Juan Miró, René Magritte, they all have very different <laughs> interpretations of what that should be. And that's why there was always tension between Dali on the one hand and other surrealists. You know, Dali always says, always said the difference between me and the surrealists is that I'm a surrealist. What he meant is that I, I'm really the only one who truly puts that ideology, that manifesto in practice, because I just think intuitively and whatever wells up in my mind, whether I'm asleep or, or awake, that's what I try to capture in my, in my visions. And of course, the work that illustrate that so perfectly is the famous work, Persistence of Memory. And we have devoted an entire chapter to this painting in our book because we think it exemplifies the, the time before World War II, this great flowering of Dali's first great um, classical period, if you will, his master, masterworks period, uh, the persistence of memory. And, you know, so many things have been written about it, like we do. Uh, we leave it up to, your, to you to interpret what you think is is the most appropriate, and, and my co-author Chris Brown has has a, a theory uh, about it as well. Uh, uh, a, a wonderful British art historian said, "A surrealist meditation on the collapse of our notions of a fixed cosmic order." Sounds great. I'm not sure if Dali would have agreed with it. Uh, he was always a bit uh, stunned and surprised by the incredible response to this work, but clearly he had touched uh, touched a nerve. One, one thing, one painting that I find one of the defining works of this particular period in his life is uh, his interpretation of uh, Die Toteninsel, which is uh, the Isle of the Dead by uh, the Swiss artist Arnold Böckling. Now, uh, this particular uh, rather depressing, uh, but very beautiful painting in 1883 depicts an ideal 
island, which is just used for the burial of the dead, such as there is one actually near Venice. Uh, the only people who go there are people to be buried. And here you see uh, one of those boats arriving at the Toten Insel uh, to deposit one more coffin with this uh, very ghost-like figure, Karon, you know, the Greek uh, a person who shepherded the souls across the Styx River. Uh, you see him depicted here. And this, you know what, this had such a huge impact. And one author wrote that you couldn't go anywhere in Europe at that time or you would see a reproduction of that, of that painting on the wall. And Salvador Dali takes it into the surrealist domain. And you can see here, of course, the background is the Bay of Caracas, once again. And you see how he has compressed those forms into very enigmatic shapes. And you wonder, where is the, where is the link between this and the original uh, painting? And that's exactly what, what Dali's trying to do. He's trying to stimulate your creative thinking about where is that, that correlation? Of course, then Dali meets his muse, Gala, and uh, we devote a very large chapter, in fact, much of the book, to Gala and her very special relationship with Salvador Dali. Unquestionably, from that point on, she becomes the dominant motif in his life. And we will see her in many, many paintings where she is uh, depicted in, in, various, uh, in various roles. And as Robert de Chan, one of the great uh, collectors and authors of a catalogue raisonné, about Dali wrote, she was the personification of the woman in his childhood dreams. And, and um, that, that is so true. I mean, she was, she was always there in his mind until she became a reality. Well, uh, then came the Spanish Civil War. And of course, we all know this uh, incredible painting. I, I hate to call it beautiful because obviously it's not meant to be beautiful, but certainly the, one of the most famous works by Pablo Picasso, Guernica. And you may not know, again, this is a situation where art historians write about an, a work but don't really see the bigger context. The reason why the German Condor Legion, this was an offshoot of the German Luftwaffe, which had, uh, under Adolf Hitler, uh, which had just been equipped with a, a range of new Stuka dive bombers and were itching to see what those planes could do. Of course, Franco, who was locked in a struggle to the death with the uh, Repub elected Republican government of Spain at that time, needed all the help he could get. And he asked for Hitler to intervene on his side. Uh, Stalin uh, decided to send help to the Republican side, even though that help wasn't always forthcoming and came with a lot of strings attached. But the German Condor Legion said, okay, where, where should we, where do you want us to attack? And uh, Franco said, uh, Guernica. And why now Guernica? Because Guernica was, was a Basque village. And the Republican government had given not only the Basque region, but also Catalonia, Catalun. Uh, the autonomy that it had sought for centuries. And Franco was deeply upset about that because he wanted to keep this Spain intact. And so the attack on Guernica was not only a terror attack, but was a specifically a message for the people of the Basque and Catalan, Catalan region, including Dali's family, that such autonomy would not be tolerated. And in fact, after Franco defeated the Republican forces in 1939 and installed his dictatorship, which would last until the 1970s, believe it or not. Uh, the first thing he did was suppress every for any form of Basque or Catalan culture, even the, the language. And uh, that's why to this day, Catalonia is still trying to recover from uh, those many, many decades of uh, the oppression of their culture and their language. Uh, this is the painting that Dali painted, uh, um, which later on became premonition of the Civil War. I'm not quite sure if that's what he had in mind when he painted it, because he was very much interested, and again, in, in soft and hard. And the original title of the work was Soft Construction 
with boiled apricots, really his fascination with food, for example, as a metaphor for things in life. And he wrote at the time, it shows a huge human body, all arms and legs, deliriously squeezing each other. And then later on, uh, it became a metaphor for Spain literally ripping itself apart. And, and that was so well captured in this painting that it became known as premonition of civil war. And one important thing Dali said at the time, he said that the Spanish civil war would produce a rediscovery of the authentic Catholic tradition peculiar to Spain. And, and he, he was thinking in, in cultural terms, he was thinking in terms of the great Spanish Baroque masters that he was so impressed with. Of course, we all know that it did happen, but from a political end. I mean, Franco literally turned back the clock to the 17th century with Spain, in which the church and himself uh, ruled society uh, for all those decades after World War. Now, we also talk about Destino, which is a wonderful story. You know, the, the World War II era is not necessarily, I would say, the most, most, most inspiring, the most fertile period for Dali. But one thing he did, he, he, he um, got in touch with Walt Disney, and together they were going to do a Disney film called Destino. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, many years ago, uh, I was retained by Disney to produce the, uh, the official biography of Walt Disney as a filmmaker and an art historian. And I actually got to talk to John Hench, who is seen here on this picture together with Walt Disney. He's the man who created Destino, or at least started to work on Destino with Salvador Dali. And, and I asked him, you know, why, why did you guys never finish that beautiful picture? It would have been an awesome picture. Imagine, you know, Walt and Dali it would have been just a, Disney and Dali would have been an incredible combination. And he said, you know what, Jean-Pierre, he said, we just ran out of money. Um, the, the World War II had, had eviscerated uh, Disney's market. Uh, he lost access to the European market, the, the cinemas there, obviously, because of the war. And uh, at the same time, the Disney studio was forced to produce a propaganda and training films, mostly training films, for the Air Force, for the Navy. And uh, those films, uh, with, with their animators, only had a, a very minimum profit margin. You know, that was decreed by the Roosevelt administration. You could only, if you work for the war effort in World War II in America, you could only have a very small margin of profit. And that's why, basically, uh, the studio was on the verge of bankruptcy near the end. And they said, we just simply could not uh, pull it off. Of course, then in 2003, uh, Roy Disney, the nephew of Walt, and I interviewed him as well for the film, uh, did produce uh, Destino in, in a way that very well you know, Dali may have, may have wanted it. The Atomic Era uh, brought a whole new uh, form of inspiration to Dali, and I think this is the second major flowering of his career, and, and Chris and I uh, worked on, on trying to identify some of the works that really articulate that great flowering. And what we write about in this particular part of the book is the, 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 the uh, desire of Dali to now connect art with science. Uh, the, the, of course, the terrible uh, uh, atom bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, had a tremendous impact on everyone. Uh, uh, in the world. Uh, at first, of course, the end of World War II and the collapse and the surrender of the Japanese Empire was, was great news. But after, when that sort of died down, people started to scratch their heads and say, my God, what have we done? Uh, we've unleashed this Pandora box. And uh, Dali then became very interested in, in the possibilities of the atomic age, the quantum the mechanics, quantum physics, which were emerging at the time, the idea that every atom in our being is actually in motion. Uh, you know, the quantum physics holds that nothing is static in the universe. Everything is in motion. And so you see uh, here in the famous Leda Atomica, of course, a painting of, of uh, Gala, everything starts to, <laughs> to levitate because nothing is still, nothing stands still, you know. And that became a wonderful source of inspiration. Same here with the 
Corpus Hypercubus, which is that famous portrait of Jesus, not attached to the cross, but sort of hovering uh, like a four-dimensional object. Uh, and what it shows is that l'automatisme, as André Breton would formulate it, is out the window. This is no longer surrealism as we know it. This is really a, a trying to look for a synthesis between science and mysticism. And, and what we articulate, we, we sort of interpret this painting as an analogy between the mystery of the divine nature of Jesus and the cubic construct of four dimensions, which is likely beyond human comprehension. We talk a lot about that in the sacred geometry that Dali was very much fascinated uh, by at, at the time. Uh, but I, I don't have enough time to go into that. But so what you see is now there's a, a, a redirection towards a whole new way of thinking about art as a bridge, if you will, to the, the science and technology that was taking the world by storm at that time. Now, stylistically, uh, you can see that this is no longer a work of the Baroque. And so that we're looking for a way, well, what were his primary impulses? And, and, and it seems that at, around this time, uh, and even before then, Dali began to collect works by classicist painters. These were academic painters of the late 19th century in France who created these very uh, mythological or historical works. They're fairly stilted, you know, they're, they're very dry, but they have tremendous technical faculty. I mean, the way they, these people control the suggestion of three-dimensional depth on a flat canvas was truly extraordinary in photography, of course, played a major role in that. And uh, now they, they called these classicist painters mockingly, you know, les pompiers. Uh, now these are firemen. <laughs> and you wonder why, but well, what's that got to do with classicist art? Well, in, in France at the time, the, the fire brigade, the firemen, uh, had helmets that looked just like the helmets worn by Greek and Roman military, you know, these beautiful helmets. And, and so in the, in the hallways of the avant-garde in Paris, you know, they were, they were dismissed, these, these, these classes made, oh, c'est pompier. And, uh, and so that's how Dali mockingly referred to him. But, but deep inside, he was deeply impressed with the incredible control of, uh, of realism by these artists. And we believe that in this last phase of his art, uh, these were the primary impulses. He would, of course, reach out to Baroque art, including not only Velasquez, but also Vermeer in Holland for motifs. But the overall gestaltung, if you will, the, the overall mise en scène, uh, the composition uh, and the realization of his work was very much influenced by works like uh, Messonnier, uh, Bougou, Work and Drops. In fact, he, he owned this canvas and many other canvases by Bougou. And so I think he drew a lot of inspiration from that. Uh, as he said at one point, uh, Messonnier, the artist of this battle scene with Napoleon on the left, uh, were a thousand times more interesting than the representatives of all those isms of, uh, of modern art. Let me end with this, uh, and then we're going to talk uh, to my co-author about his incredible uh, collection of Dali graphics. And one of those drawings that uh, Chris has is this uh, sketch for perhaps the most famous Dali, certainly in the United States which is the Sacrament of the Last Supper. And uh, this drawing was acquired by, uh, uh, by Chris uh, a few years ago. And you can see in this early composition for the Sacrament of the Last Supper that, that he originally thought very much along the lines of Leonardo's Last Supper fresco. And you see, once again, the, the merger of science, mysticism, that became so important uh, at this phase of his life. And, and he would, time and again, he would reach back to the classicist artists of the 19th century France. Look at this beautiful uh, painting of Galen Nude from behind and the uh, very similar work by Jean-Auguste Dominique Angre, uh, which is um, uh, showing a very similar composition of uh, a lady coming out of the bath. La Grande Baigneuse, a lady who just stepped out of her bath. Uh, so th th that impulse remained with him for the remainder of his life, including on this, this beautiful work, which is actually in the 
Dali Museum in St. Petersburg. And I urge you, if you haven't been there yet, to please go there and see this and other Grand Machine, as the French would call it, the Grand Machine, these, these huge paintings that are really the hallmark of uh, this period. Beautiful work, the discovery of America by Christopher Columbus. You know, and it's interesting, this work was actually commissioned by uh, an American patron, the Huntington Hartsford Gallery of Modern Art in New York. And uh, it had a particular resonance for Dali at the time because it was around this period that some historians, most of them from Catalonia, were arguing that Christopher Columbus wasn't really an Italian, but was really from Catalonia. <laughs> so that uh, 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 the Catalonians discovered uh, the Americas rather than the Spanish. So it, it, this had, of course, a very special resonance for him. And here again, we see Gala as the patron saint blessing this great, great journey. So let me introduce to you uh, my co-author and partner in crime, uh, Christopher, Dr. Christopher Brown. Uh, Chris, tell us, when did you start to collect Dali graphics and why? Um, thank you for the question, Jean-Pierre, and hello, everybody, and thank you to the Dali Museum. I wanted to uh, start collecting Dali based on early childhood experiences, really. My parents, uh, in 1968, ordered two Dali etchings from the Collector's Guild, and, of course, those went over the couch, so there was quite a bit of time to be able to evaluate and examine these uh, etchings. And they were beautiful because they had to do with the Spanish immorals and a beautiful horse being drawn or etched. And then uh, Don Quixote or El Cid. So from a very early point in living in the Washington, D.C. suburbs uh, and going to the National Gallery of Art and the Smithsonian's, the cultural and art part of my life was, was really stressed by my parents, that I needed to be more than just studying and getting good grades in school and having good friends. And it needed to be also structured with cultural things, whether it was art or singing or theater. And, and of course, um, as you started to collect uh, these Dolly graphics, uh, there were some, some challenges, some pitfalls to overcome because the market for Dolly graphics is, is sometimes a little bit difficult to, uh, to understand. Is that correct? It, it can be, but I want to make it really easy for all of the, all of the listeners out there. There are books uh, by Albert Fields and, uh, on how to basically find a real Dolly. Problem was, uh, some of Dolly's agents or managers took advantage of him. And because he was traveling between the United States and Spain, he or multiple managers would have him sign blank pieces of paper. And they would say, sign these, I'm gonna take it to the press, that work that you just finished, we're gonna print up 2,000 copies of it and, and it'll be ready to go. And of course, Dolly believing in his managers allowed that to happen, but you know, being unscrupulous managers, they allowed these 2,000 pieces of paper, for example, to, that Dolly signed just to be out in the marketplace, which allowed after his death and after the period of time in the mid 80s where he really wasn't doing as much art for people to come up with these after dollies or fake dollies or people signing a forged name. So there are books out there that make it very simple for uh, anybody who, who wants to go beyond just having a beautiful piece of art on, uh, up over the couch. They want to go into collecting or they want to have a, a couple pieces that is an investment. So anybody who's going to do that should have either uh, Albert Field's book on references is a catalog resume on th these are each piece that Dolly etched or painted or did a lithograph of. This is how many are in the edition. This is the kind of paper it's on. This is the watermark. And if you're on eBay and you're looking at a piece, you first got to make the decision, do I want to pay that much money for this piece? Is it just a value to me to put over the couch or is it an investment? So if it's an investment, then you've got to say to the person selling you, can you please reference to me in Fields or in M&L, which is another reference book, what page and, and how this conforms to being a real authentic work? So Frank Hunter was very instrumental in that process as well. Is that not true? Um, that's correct. Um, in 1996, after 40 years of work by Albert Fields and putting it together, the catalog resume, he put out this beautiful book. There were some errors in it. And, you know, there was a couple images that or lithographs that he didn't have the best picture of it, so he made a drawing of it. So Frank Connor, after 
um, Albert Fields passed away, took over Albert Fields collection, basically. And he also took over the responsibility of certifying all the graphic works. Now, Frank is a wonderful resource, and I would say a good majority of my graphics have been certified by Frank Hunter. So in the graphic world, Frank Hunter is one of the leading authorities. There's many, and we have several really, really good ones in the United States. Uh, there's really not any in Europe. They're here all in the U.S. So if you have a graphic work, you want it certified, authenticated, besides you doing your research first and asking the seller, hey, provide me that this is a real Dali and why I should pay this price, you could always send it to Frank or you could send it to one of the certifiers with images or send the piece and they will certify it for you so that it is unique and real. But for the most part, this was a very dedicated artist who really pre-planned all of his paintings. That sounds great. Now we're talking, you mentioned the, the, the drawings that are in the book. So let, let's go, let's take a look at one and I'm going to sh uh, share the screen for a moment. Uh, because the one thing that, the one drawing that has gotten a lot of press attention uh, around the world actually is uh, your drawing of Dali's study for the sacrament of the Last Supper. How did you uh, come across this, this drawing? Well, a very good friend of mine, uh, my, uh, Michael Schwartz, who owns Gallery Michael in Beverly Hills, uh, and I were visiting one weekend, and I showed him uh, this beautiful drawing that was coming up for sale by Sotheby's in Europe. And I said, Michael, as you know, with all the works that I've done with, with Da Vinci, uh, that I feel very confident that Dolly really relied on the old masters. And he would take one or two or three of the works of the old masters, and he would reformulate them into you know, somewhat surrealism, but also bring in, you know, uh, uh, their reference to how they would s have set it up. And these are all the old masters, of course. So here we have basically a copy, uh, except the heads are uh, kneeling down in reverence to Christ uh, or to the Eucharist, uh, just like da Vinci painted the Last Supper. And Judas is on the same side as Jesus Christ. So Christ and the 12 disciples all lined up on one side. So each of the drawings that I have here have been authenticated by Nicholas and Oliver Descharnes. And in fact, the Dolly Foundation was given the provenance, which means the ownership of these documents and drawings uh, was shared with the Dolly Foundation and, and approved when we uh, wrote the book. Very good. Well, Chris, thank you so much uh, for sharing your thoughts and ideas about uh, collecting Dolly graphics. And for those of you who are interested in uh, Reading the book, The Dali Legacy, it will be formally released on March 23rd, even though it's now available for pre-order on Amazon or your local bookstore. We should never forget to also patronize our local bookstores. Thanks so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you.